This is the first in a sequence of videos I'm making which are intended as a crash course in topological spaces for people who've already seen the notion of a metric space and the notion of continuity in that context and who want to learn about the more general context of topological spaces. So in this first video I am going to motivate for you the definition of a topological space tell you what the definition is, tell you about the definition of continuity of maps between topological spaces and then in subsequent videos I will explain how you construct lots of examples of topological spaces and the kind of properties they can have like compactness and hemispherically. So I want to start by reminding you of a lemma from the theory of metric spaces which says the following. So if uh, x and y are metric spaces, I'm not going to give the metrics names, um, and f is a map from x to y, then f is continuous, which I'm just going to write CTS because I need to write it so much, if and only if f inverse of u is open for any open set u. So the key thing about this lemma is that it's telling us continuity, which is this notion that's usually defined in terms of epsilons and deltas, can be reformulated with no reference to epsilons and deltas at all, just in terms of open sets. And the fact that if you take the preimage of an open set, you get an open set. Going back again, from this definition in terms of open sets to the definition in terms of epsilons and deltas, the way the epsilons and deltas reappear is in the definition of the open sets. Right? In a metric space, the open sets are unions of open balls, and the open balls are specified by some point, which is the center, and some epsilon, or delta, which is the radius. So the we're going to think of this, this lemma is kind of abstracting away the most important part of the notion of continuity which is that it preserves open sets in this sense and the fact that those open sets happen to be expressed in terms of epsilons and deltas in the case of metric spaces is not important if you're interested in a more general context than metric spaces. So what might that more general context look like? Well, if I want to make sense of this as a definition of continuity, that the preimage of any open set is open, I need a notion of open set. So let's make a definition. A topology, T, on a set X is a collection of subsets of X. And that collection is required to meet the following requirements. And these requirements come from the theory of metric spaces. They come from thinking about how we want our open sets to behave and just making that, those um, expectations into a requirement or a definition. So first of all, we expect the empty sets to be open. And I'm going to write that as empty set in topology, right? So topology T is, is a collection of subsets, and I'm saying the empty set is one of those subsets. And we also want the whole set X to be in a topology. The whole set X should be open. Again, this is, this is true in metric spaces, right? The whole space is an open set, the empty set is an open set. So uh, that's why we're requiring it. 
in general because that's what we expect open sets to be like. Um, what else do we expect that we can do with open sets? Well, we expect that we can take unions of open sets. Right, the union of open sets in metric spaces is open. Um, so let's just put that in as a requirement. And actually, I want to say arbitrary unions of open sets. And instead of saying open sets, these are sets in the topology, are in the topology. In other words, suppose I have um, given a collection U I of open sets U I where I ranges over some indexing set I capital I such that all of these guys are in T so this set is a subset of T then the union of U I taken over all I in the indexing set is again in the topology. And the word arbitrary here means that this indexing set can be anything you want. So it could be infinite, it could be uncountably infinite, it doesn't matter. If you're taking unions of open sets, you should always get an open set, no, many, no matter how many you are union, unioning. <laughs> By contrast, we want to allow intersections of open sets, but we don't want to allow arbitrary intersections because it's not too hard to come up with examples just in the real line of infinite collections of open sets whose intersection is not open. But finite intersections should always be open. So finite intersections of sets in T are in T, i.e. given a collection of sets in T, where now the indexing set is finite, uh, the intersection should be in T. Right, so only finite intersections. And as I said, both of these are motivated by what we observe for metric spaces. So now that we know what a topology is, I can define a topological space to just be a set equipped with the topology. That's what a topological space is going to be. It's a set together with a collection of subsets that we think of as open sets. Notice the same set can have many different topologies. It's not like there's just one topology that fits all. For example, let me just give you an example which satisfies these definitions but looks nothing like a metric space. So for any set X, the indiscrete topology is a topology you can always write down and it's the stupidest thing you could write down that satisfies all these conditions. So well, it needs to contain the empty set and it needs to contain the whole space, but that's all it needs to contain. Right? So the first uh, requirement is that it contains those two guys. If you take unions and intersections of those, you stay within the empty set and the whole space. You can never get anything else. So that is a topology. It's not a very useful topology, 
it's very very coarse there's no sort of subsets of subsets of subsets of subsets it's just either everything or nothing so this is a topology on any set that you like and there's another topology which is the complete opposite which is the discrete topology where you just take t to be all subsets of x otherwise known as the power set of x so this is very very fine in the sense that you know you can always find very 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 small subsets that completely separate the points if you think of the discrete topology as kind of saying i just have a bunch of points that have nothing to do with one another because now i can find an open set that just contains this one or an open set that just contains this one so this is really the word discrete here is like discrete space made up of lots of completely distinct points indiscrete is not a great name but it just means the opposite of the discrete topology right this has got very few open sets this has got as many as it could possibly have so this is just to emphasize that you can have whatever topology you want on the set x and there are many topologies in between the discrete and indiscrete topologies that are maybe more useful generally so with this notion of topological space i can now talk about continuous maps between topological spaces so given topological spaces x is a topology s and y is a topology t a map f from x to y is called continuous i'm just going to abbreviate to cts if um, f inverse u is open in x in other words it's in the topology s for all open sets u in y in other words for all sets in the topology on y so let's use this definition of continuous map to prove something about continuous maps that we know to be true in the case of metric spaces and I think the proof becomes more elegant in the context of topological spaces when you strip away all the epsilons and deltas so the lemma is given topological spaces x y and z and I'm I know I just told you any set can have lots of different topologies and you should specify the topology you're talking about in this lemma I'm, I'm not going to specify which topologies I'm using on x y and z you should think of x as a set with a topology uh, so given topological spaces x y and z and maps f from x to y and g from y to, e uh, to z then if f and g are continuous then the composition uh, g composed f which goes from x to y and then from y to z so all the way from x to z is continuous okay so the compositions of continuous maps are continuous proof well I need to take an open set in Z and I need 
to take its pre-image under Gcompose F. Okay, so if I take its pre-image under Gcompose F, I first take its pre-image under G, and then I take the pre-image of that under F. And G inverse of U is open because U is an open set in Z and G is a continuous map. So G inverse of U is open as F, uh, uh, sorry, as G is continuous. And because G inverse of U is open and because F is continuous, F inverse of G inverse of U is open. So uh, F is continuous. That implies F inverse G inverse U is open. And that tells me that this G compose F inverse of U is open because that's equal to F inverse G inverse U. Which is what I wanted. The pre image of an open set and its composition is open. So you can see this definition really makes this lemma very easy to prove. Okay, so in the next video I'll give you a bunch of examples of topological spaces and ways of constructing new topological spaces out of old ones.